in three, two. Good afternoon. I now call to order the May 9th, 2022 meeting of the Policy Review Committee of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. In accordance with Board Policy 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's policy review committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through Microsoft Teams Live on the BCPS website. To conduct this meeting by virtual means, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Additionally, as a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Clark or Ms. Howie if you must leave the call by using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Ms. Clark, Clark, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Causey? Dr. Hager? Present. Ms. Han? Present. Ms. Mack? Mr. Thomas? Mr. Thomas, you're muted. I see you. Here. Sorry, here. <laughs> Ms. Rowe? Present. You have a quorum, ma'am. Thank you. Ms. Clark, please call the role of staff members participating in today's meeting. Ms. Anderson? Good afternoon. Ms. Charlie Green? Ms. Howie? Here. Dr. McComas? Present. Mr. Dixit? Present. Ms. Ferguson? Present. Dr. Wistead? Present. Ms. Becker? Present. Ms. Hesler? Present. Mr. Plate? Present. Ms. Somerville? Present. Ms. Stansberry? Present. Ms. Prozer? Present. Ms. Roller? Present. Ms. Ms. Watts Hitchcock? Present. Ms. Hahn? Present. And have are any other staff members on the call that I failed to call? Thank you. Thank you. The first item for business is policy 5470, wellness. Um, Dr. McComas, please proceed. Excuse me, uh, Dr. McComas, Ms. Rowe, if I could just um, interrupt for a brief moment. The uh, policy that is that has been posted, there was um, notice from staff that there was one error in the policy, so it's been reposted. There's one word change. Page two, line 17, now reads instead of athletic, it reads physical as opposed to national athletic, national physical. Just wanted to make sure uh, that the board was aware if the board had accessed that document prior to the reposting today. Thank you. And again, my excuses. Thank you. So good afternoon. Thank you, Ms. Howie. And um, we're bringing forward our uh, wellness policy. I know Dr. Hager, this is one that's particularly um, passionate for you. I'm going to quickly turn it over to our team uh, to share the updates and revisions that we're bringing forward today. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ferguson. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Dr. McComas. Um, I have Deb Somerville on the line. Uh, she uh, helped to lead the revisions or the the committee that um, helped to revise this particular policy. So I'm not going to steal her thunder. I'm going to let her uh, share and I'll be right here to support that. Thank you. Thank you. Hopefully no thunder. So <laughs> I think we've had enough of that. Uh, we so the the wellness policy 5470 has been updated really to in, enhance its alignment with the healthy Hunger Free Kids Act of 2010 and kind of a little bit of history as far back as 2004 
um, the federal government issued um, rules about schools having wellness policies and it, that those rules were kind of linked with our funding for our school lunch program, our school meal program. And what happened over time is our first wellness policy was adopted in 2006. And over time, the um, federal government rules have been beefed up to make wellness policies stronger. And what you're seeing in Baltimore County schools is a corresponding response to additional requirements, feedback from um, from Dr. Hager's group from the Maryland um, Wellness Policies and Practices Project, um, where they gave school systems feedback on <clears throat> their wellness program, um, and also just best practices. You'll see not numerous different groups that are establishing guidelines for um, improving school wellness. Um, and you know, I think it goes without saying why we care about wellness is that we know that health, if we've experienced anything, just the disease part of health is at the top of our mind, but really health in all its ways is closely aligned with student academic achievement. An anemic kid has less oxygen in their brain and ha learns less. I mean, so there's just so many connections. A sleep deprived child, a hungry child. We know many, many ways that um, health impacts learning um, and enhance a healthy child will be a better learner. So um, we believe that this is very consistent with the board's um, precepts, values, and beliefs, um, and really will also help us comply with the rules from our federal government, which are tied to significant funding for our, our, our um, school system. The other thing you'll see with this policy is it helps identify the integration and coordination between a number of other board policies. So you see the 5410 for school counseling, 5420 for school health services, 5430 for psych services, 5510 for cl school climate, 3310 for food and nutrition services. It really pulls those together and um, makes sure that we articulate how, how we all work together to support healthy children. Um, the other refinement, and I think the big refinement that's happened this time is we had systematic public input. So not only did staff work on this, but we used our school health council to get key stakeholders. So everything from pediatricians to parents to advocates to look at this policy and look at best practices of other school systems and um, federal guidelines to enhance the policy. Um, some of the biggest changes for the policy is um, honestly accountability. Um, so every school, this policy requires every school to have um, a, a, a wellness liaison appointed and to annually certify compliance with the policy. And then we as a school system must then review those certifications and do an annual report to the Board of Education on our wellness policy. So those are the big kind of high arching. When you look at the policy before you, you will see a lot of additions. And those additions provide specificity in the areas, particularly the areas that um, the federal government um, has put out in their rule that we must address. So, and I think to some extent in the past, we addressed it in the rule. So some of those rule things have been moved into policy. Um, and so I think I'll pause. Kim, did I leave anything out that I should have said? Um, no, right now um, I believe that that is pretty much everybody received the policy. So that's just a high level overview. So um, I'm sure there's time for questions and comments at, right now. Committee members, are there any questions? Dr. Hager? Um, I just want to start start by saying that I think that the committee and and Ms. Somerville and everyone who was in charge of this did such a fantastic job with these revisions. Um, this is a huge overhaul of our policy, and and it aligns really nicely with a lot. I mean, so many changes have taken place over the past couple of years. I know it was a a really huge undertaking, and I'm I'm just really excited about about this. Um, there are a few small things that I I would. Uh, like the committee to consider um, with the policy. One is that I did not see um, anything in the policy with respect to food marketing, which is part of the federal law. Um, and given that it's it's not really a district level decision to go into the regulations, it is a very clear part of the federal law. I thought that that should be included in the policy. And, and so if you're not familiar, 
Um, the federal law says that there can be no um, marketing of any food on campus that does not meet what the federal law says is smart snack standards. Um, in Maryland, we have kind of an extension of smart snacks, which is uh, Maryland, I always have to look at it, it's, it's a mouthful, Maryland Nutrition Standards for All Foods Sold in Schools, um, which is just uh, smart snacks with a few additional items kind of included in it. So I don't know, Ms. Somerville, if you have any, if there was a reason that the marketing piece was left out or what your thoughts were. So, so Dr. Hager, I'm sorry, um, that is, I do see that that comment and section 5e is that is that what you're talking about um so it's on page you know what i must have missed it i don't know what i googled that i or looked for that i didn't see it i think it because it was under the nutrition environment i apologize you do have it in there so um smart snacks have you did you consider using the terms uh maryland Nutrition standards for all foods sold in schools as opposed to smart snacks? Um, it looks like we use the USDA smart snack nutrition standards. That would be. So the state recommends that we use the state version, um, which is again an extension of smart snacks. Um, it would just be a, a small, like, fine replace. Can you say that one more time, Dr. Hay? Yeah, it's, it's a big one. <laughs> Smart snacks rolls off your tongue, but not this one. Um, Maryland Nutrition Standards for All Foods Sold in Schools. So yeah, we, we uh, I'm trying to remember, it's been a while, but I believe it's like um, diet soda is included, whereas diet soda is allowed with the um, federal marketing. Thank you. Um, and I could have missed this one as well because I was, uh, I clearly missed the marketing one. Um, and thank you for pointing that out that I missed that. I apologize for that. Um, foods provided but not sold during the school day. I saw something about things being sold and then I saw the um, foods provided at celebrations would be determined under the superintendent's rule. Um, is there a reason why we're not putting that in the policy? So right now the, the rule reads that um, again, any celebrations, anytime food is provided to a child during the school day for a celebration that it must meet smart snack standards. And so that's what our, our rule says. And then the federal policy, the federal policy says we have to specify what we are going to do about foods provided but not sold, but doesn't say what we have to do. So um, figure if that follows. OK, I'm looking for it. So we have um, Miss Miss Hetzler from Food and Nutrition Services. I any she's here. I think the question was to delineate what's included in the rule versus what's included in the policy. And why is that particular section included in the rule, but not the policy? Thank if you, Ms. Answer that question. <laughs> Hi, this is Jamie Hetzel here. I'm just looking through now, trying to find where it's located in, in the policy. So on, I just, um, page eight, um, it says the superintendent shall establish guidelines to implement local wellness policy that include, but, that are, but are not limited to, and then number three says communicating standards for all other foods and beverages available on the school campus, but not sold, such as those provided at classroom parties and school celebrations and as rewards and incentives, although I think earlier it says that food cannot be used as a reward. So it just, um, it's something that we, by kind of punting that to the rule, I just wasn't quite sure why when it is another one of those items that is, is specified in the wellness policy, federal final rule that we need, we need to include in our policy. So I just didn't know why it was not in there. I'm looking through it now. I don't know that there was a specific reason that it was admitted. Um, I'm looking for the same topic on both the policy and the rule to compare. Yeah, and we can get back. We can come back to that. And I have one last thing, and then I know Christian has questions too. Um, my my other question uh, for discussion would be um, around kind of the lead, different leadership roles that are specified in the policy. So um, it talks about having the uh, system level folks uh, identified on page two, which includes the chief academic officer. 
Um, and then it goes on to talking about establishing a wellness liaison, which is a key part of wellness policy implementation, which is great. But then it also goes on to talk about identifying a wellness champion who would then be for employee wellness. And then it goes on to finally mention the local school health council, which is typically the, the entity that has a really important part in wellness policies, and they aren't mentioned until pages six and seven. So um, I just didn't know if there's a way to kind of solidify kind of the leadership structure around wellness policy implementation because it kind of feels a little bit piecemealed at this point. If anybody has any thoughts on that or. Could someone explain each of those roles and what they functionally do, like what it looks like? I'd be happy to attempt to. <laughs> so I think the the principal and the chief academic officer are probably pretty straightforward. You know, the chief academic officer will review the principal's assessments. The principals will assess their schools and report on implementation. The wellness liaison is really the new uh, role. We've been trying to have wellness liaisons um, for several years now, and it's the point person in the school to help identify a wellness, uh, the wellness program for their school. What are our bi kids' biggest needs, and what are we going to focus on this year? So it might be physical activity. It might be. Um, it might be a, a more of a mental health, so they might be doing um, mindfulness. So it's really to look at when looking at our children's health and our health programs for our kids, what are we going to do and how are we going to coordinate it in our building? So that's the wellness liaison and it really has a student focus, but it can imp include employees. Historically, in the, the school wellness, what is it called, uh, Dr. Hager? Um, the wellness champion? A lot and, of, yeah, it varies uh, district to district, but yeah, I'm trying to remember so the, what yeah. we called it. In our policy, they have a liaison, which is the whole school person, and then a champion, which is champion. the employee wellness person, which I think could get a little mucky. Yeah, right. The wellness champion again was it was a role that has existed for many years, much longer actually than the wellness liaison, and it focused on getting employee wellness messages out to staff. Um, in my head. The wellness champion would be a committee member of the school wellness team and report, so to speak, or coordinate, be coordinated by that wellness liaison. The titling, the naming is definitely confusing. And my only other comment would be in employee wellness, there's no person who owns it, whereas in most other areas, we have a person in the building that more owns that content area. I think that's probably one of the big reasons why we wanted to have wellness champions so it was clear in every school who was in charge of those employee wellness initiatives. And I will say anecdotally, um, I have approached uh, principals before and said, you know, tell me about your wellness team, you know, who's who's in charge of the wellness team and they'll say, oh, so and so. And then it turns out that person is in charge of forwarding the emails from the you know, HR about employee wellness initiatives and doesn't really do anything at the at the school level for the kids. And so I I just worry that the the words wellness liaison, wellness champion can can be a little confusing. And there are a lot of districts that use the term wellness champion as the wellness team leader. Um, Dr. Hager, were you going to make a motion about the Maryland Nutrition Standards replacing the other language? Um, I I could I could certainly do that. That would be a, a very small change. Um, do we do we want to answer questions and then come back to kind of specific changes, or how do you want to do this, Ms. Rock? It doesn't matter. We could do it now, or we could do it later. I just don't want to move past you if you have a motion that you want to make. No, uh, um, I would love to hear other people's kind of thoughts on the policy, and then um, I can make kind of small changes if that's okay at the end. Sure, that's fine. That's all. Thank you. Christian. Thank you. And I, I've loved reading this policy. Um, thank you for everyone who put the work in to, to, to make this what it is today. Uh, so uh, on, I can't, I don't know how the page, but I'll just read it um, aloud right now. So where it says school employees may not deny participation in recess or other physical activity as a form of discipline or punishment unless the safety of students is in question. And I'm wondering, is that coming from a national or state standard or regulation? 
don't believe that is a national. I don't believe it's in regulation. OK, can I ask why we have put that put that specific information? Because at first I was taken aback. I went to uh, Middle River Middle School last week and we were talking to students about kind of disciplinary measures for, for students and a teacher had said that they're not allowed to uh, remove a student from being able to participate in recess if they, you know, were acting out in class. And so is that in essence what that what that is doing is it's not basically saying that students are entitled to recess and we can't we can't pull them out for any reason. Michelle. OK, so I didn't know if you want me to address it. So there there's a document called Reasons for Recess um, that yeah. we kind of follow. And along with that, um, Christian, when discussion was around recess, it became a concern when, of the principals that were on the committee to say a student was involved in a fight or an altercation, and then they went outside to recess, um, and then they were going to interact with the same students. So I think that last little caveat was put in there basically to say that the principal still held, you know, if there was an altercation or some kind of physical um, situation that happened that was a fight or something like that, where they felt that it wasn't safe for students to, to go out. OK, so this is saying that. An in, the only instance where students can be not allowed to participate in recess is say if there's a safety concern in terms of uh, school safety and violence in that way. Correct. OK, but if a student was say in class, like just calling out answers and not raising their hand, we can't use that as a me as a method uh, for discipline. Right, that's not the method. That's not the same as if they were in a fight and they were waiting for suspension or whatever was occurring that there there needed to be the levels of discipline to talk to them. Um, so that was that. But it wasn't if you're not sitting down in your seat, then I'm going to take away recess. OK, and the other one is the use of food rewards and incentives to encourage student achievement or desirable behavior is strongly discouraged and at first, I, I love that, but I was thinking about it more and I was like, well, sometimes like I remember in elementary school, candy was used as, as an incentive for answering something right or, you know, scoring so scoring like a, a. High on a test and this is saying that that is discouraged then. It is we do, it's it's considered a low low level reward and it is not a reward that we use that we choose to use for lots of reasons for health reasons. But we do have some students with special needs who really we need to start with some of those more simple or low level rewards. So that's why it was an outright banned, but it is strongly discouraged. That was kind of the thinking behind that language. OK. Um, when we were discussing. Uh, which. Sorry on page four as we outlined the nutrition nutrition environment and services one thing that i noticed is that uh is, is this the only policy that we really have that is referring to nutrition and food services in bcps and in, in this segment of the wellness policy i'm going to turn defer to dr Hetzler, miss hetzler for this one hi this is jamie no, there's definitely other policies um, that refer to our program as a whole. Um, obviously, this policy was just focused on the impacts of the food program on the wellness policy. OK, because I, I love some of the components, especially with things like school meals will include fresh locally grown foods from farms engaged in sustainable practices whenever possible and uh, other components such as that. Uh, one suggestion that I had um, and that I I I guess I'll, I'll make a motion for um, right now just just to have a conversation um, is one thing I've learned from my school business is that um, students really want to be engaged in the selection of, of food options that we have in our schools and students uh, have a lot of concerns when it comes to the food that we have offered in our schools. I know that food is very highly regulated, uh, but I do think that we should be engaging students more. So um, within this uh, section, um, on page five under the nutrition environment and services uh, section i move to insert on an annual basis a stakeholder work group comprised of at least 40 percent students shall be convened to provide recommendations to the board and superintendent for but not limited to nutritional value taste appeal sizes and inclusiveness of food options in bcps to line eight of page five so that's 
sorry, line nine of page five. That will be creating another letter. That will be letter G. I'll second that, Christian. And the reason that I'd like to second that is because my daughter um, and um, different other uh, Muslim children in our community have expressed concerns that there are different fasting schedules that they're on. And on the days when they cannot eat meat or dairy, there's literally nothing in school for them to eat. And they live on protein bars they bring with them because in addition to books and a computer, they just can't carry musical instruments, books, a computer, and a lunch. So um, if we had vegetarian and vegan options available to at least meet a minimum calorie intake, um, I think that's a thing that would have come out in student feedback that maybe wouldn't have come out any other way. This is Jamie. I just wanted to add that um, a lot of these things are included in the food program policy, like the normal um, food policy. Um, I'm not sure if this policy is perhaps the appropriate portion for all of that. Um, I know there are sections and I'm, and I'm going by memory here. There are sections about student involvement and such. Um, I don't disagree that it perhaps needs stronger language or some more specific items in there to enhance that policy. Um, but according to you know the well stat, I don't know that it's it's a for a part of the wellness policy necessarily. So are you suggesting that the board can't go beyond the law and add things that we want? No, of course not. Um, okay. I'm just suggesting that there's there's overlap in more than one policy and some of those policies might be better suited for the 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 standard food program policies versus this one that's focused on wellness. OK, um, Dr. Hager, do you have a comment on the motion? Um, I do. I, I agree about the um, I was just looking at policy 3310, which is the um, the food uh, food nutrition services or food services policy. And I, I, I love student feedback and I think that that's a, a great, like to put that into policy would be wonderful. There, I know that the food program, when there's not a pandemic and major supply chain issues, they do a lot of taste testing and, and getting a lot of feedback before trying out new menu items. I know that that's part of just the common practice, but of course putting those things into policy sounds great. Um, as far as the language of the motion specifically, the students would have no ability to modify the nutritional value or the size of the meals. Um, really, it would be taste, appeal, and inclusiveness would really be the only feasible things that students could do just because of how highly regulated the federal meal programs are. Um, so again, and also just as an aside, the, the concept of a wellness liaison functioning as leading a wellness team, like that's the sort of work that they should be doing at the school level, like where they get the feedback from the students, they work with the cafeteria manager at the school level, like all that stuff could be happening through the wellness liaison and the wellness policy. Um, so those are just my my general comments. I, I like this idea, not sure it fits into the wellness policy, but I really like it a lot. Um, and then just those two changes that that they couldn't, couldn't weigh in on. Uh, Julie? Thank you. Um, I too support this um, motion strongly. Um, so thank you, Mr. Thomas, for making it. I would offer a friendly amendment to the language to insert on at least an annual basis, just because I think the superintendent um, should have that flexibility um, to do it more frequently if, if we offer additional or new food items um, to solicit student feedback, especially. Um, I would also support um, more flexibility into um, the com composition of the work group so that if we just wanted to um, get student feedback um, more frequently, we've got a captive audience um, that could be done at any time um, in the cafeteria and just solicit that feedback, whether formally or informally. I too am not sure if it belongs in this policy, although I do think that with the implementation of the wellness policy and the nutritional standards, while necessary, I think the quality um, and the you know the taste, the appeal, certainly have become more of a concern um, as we've implemented these standards. I think the 
the need is greater um, to find foods that appeal to to students that are also of equal nu nutritional value. I think that the necessity for this is is even higher. So I would support that. And those are the two um, suggestions I would um, submit in terms of friendly amendments. Thank you. So just point out, and I believe it's um, section 1291 of Robert's Rules of Order, newly revised 12th edition. There is no such thing as a friendly amendment. Uh, you can certainly make an amendment to insert. Uh, I believe Dr. Hager mentioned she might make a mention, make a motion to strike. Uh, so those are acceptable, but friendly really doesn't exist. Yes, I was just going to say that we have a motion on the floor. So, um, Julie, if you want to put in the chat the language of your amendment. Sure. Um, Ms. Rowe. Go ahead, Christian. I've been taking notes. I think this might sum up um, the comments that Dr. Hager made as well as the comments that Miss Hen made. Uh, it it strikes out okay, the two so things that Dr. Hager made and it added at least to the beginning for um, Miss Hen's comments. Okay, while well, Julie's typing in it, it has to actually read with the strike and with what's being inserted. So, Aaron, if you could type in your amendment as well, then we'll process one and then we'll process the next one. Um, I think I'll, what I'll so, enter, I think, reflects Dr. Hager's as well, but we'll see. So, Ms. Rowe, okay. as I read what Mr. Thomas has resubmitted, it looks as if it incorporates the strike that Dr. Hager mentioned. Okay, so can I process that amendment with a consensus if no one objects to that language? Well, or do we have to take a vote as an amendment to change the language to this? So the assembly currently has the, the motion, the motion's on the floor. Uh, you can seek consensus of the assembly uh, to process the new motion, to withdraw the other one. This is an informal assembly. It's fewer than 12 persons, so it can certainly be done that way so that you don't have to uh, vote twice. Sure. OK. Um, does anyone object to withdrawing the original motion and then processing this language? OK, hearing none, is there a motion to approve the language on at least an annual basis? A stakeholder work group comprised of at least 40 percent students shall be convened to provide recommendations to the board and superintendent for, but not limited to, taste, quality, appeal, and inclusiveness of food options in BCPS. So move, Thomas. Second. OK, second, Hen. Um, are there any other comments or questions related to the motion? Um, Christian? Yeah, I, I just have a comment. Um, the reason I said 40% was because uh, this is something that actually was introduced in Montgomery County as well, a similar uh, resolution with this, with the number 40%. So that's where that number came from. I just wanted to state that. Okay, Dr. Hager? Um, just kind of functionally, um, so, uh, and I, I know I, I, I had my moments to, to ask questions, but the, the motions that I would make would be to highlight the important role of the local school health council and I would just love to see if, if this were to go into practice to this to be for this to be part of our local school health council, which is where our, our stakeholders from around the, the county who work in the area of school wellness to bring in to bring students into that local school health council in general would be wonderful. And then this could be a clear specific role. So just to, to kind of comment that that uh, that we're, we're starting to create a lot of like stakeholder groups and leadership roles within this policy. And so ensuring that this student group that's uh, specifically discussing nutrition in schools kind of be part of that leadership umbrella of the wellness policy. You know, I, I think that not that we need a flow chart or anything right now, but some sort of way that to really understand how they fit into the bigger role of the wellness policy leadership, I think could be important down the road. So okay. if I may, members of the committee, I think that's the 
sort of direction that staff would need now. So that's it's this is your policy and staff will have to be will have to implement it. So we would need to know what your intent is for the role of this stakeholder group to whom this group is reporting if there are other specific members you need um, and that you're anticipating uh, on the the work group. So I, I'll be blunt with you. I'm confused as to where you would want this group to fit in the constellation that already exists. So any clarification that the committee can provide would be deeply appreciated. And Ms. Somerville, I see your camera is on. Is it page six that talks about the Wellness Council? I'm trying to find that. Where is that? Mentioned on page six, line 39, page seven, line 22, and page seven, line 38. But it's not mentioned earlier. And again, it, it, they play a pretty important role in this work. So we could. We could. Um, change. Um, the language of this so that instead of a stakeholder work group that the community um, council, what are we calling this council? It's it's a local school health council. It's also mandated okay. through state state law. So we could have the local school health council um, convene the stakeholder work group as part of their council function. And they could convene part of that in a school to accommodate the presence of students already being in school. So the question then is, how do we signify that in this language that this stakeholder work group is a function of the community council? Like, should it be moved to the section that talks about the community council and the work of that council? Right, and I think that is what's missing from the policy. There's nothing really describing what the local school health council is or does in the policy. Um, did anyone else have suggestions or comments on that? Ms. Rowe? Yes. I just thought that maybe we could add to the language of the motion. Um, uh, after comprise of at least 40% students and in collaboration with a local school health council. Um, I guess that would necessarily mean that it was like a part of the local school health council. Um, well, yeah, we could also say on at least an annual basis, the school health council will convene. A stakeholder work group comprised of at least 40% students, which means it's up to the health council to put that group together to collect this information. Mm -hmm. And uh, does the board have in law, Dr. Hager, you might be the best person to answer this, um, the ability to like mandate what the local school health council does? Ms. Somerville has been the co-chair for a long time, so she, she certainly can, can chime in. No, no, no. Um, so the the state law just just says that every local jurisdiction must have a school health council that combines the efforts of the school system and the local health department. So that's really where the this it's like a collaboration between those two entities, and then we have a state school health council as well. But uh, Ms. Somerville may have better insight into kind of how that's happened in Baltimore County over the years and um whether there's any policy that you know of that specifies membership or direction or things like that so no i'm not i, I believe that the school health council has always been included as part of our wellness policy so as you're absolutely right it is part it's in the um it's in state regulation it's required that we that we actually in state reg, uh, law too. So we're required to have one that advises the superintendent and the health officer. The composition of it, I, I'd have to pull up those regs. I didn't um, do that in advance. It's very, very you know, general in the um, in the requirements. We don't have that it beyond. We do have it's addressed twice in terms of family community involvement. It's addressed twice who would be in it. 
um, and the rule in front of you under section nine and under section 10. The stress on it being a community council, not just a staff council. Um, and historically, the superintendent and the health officer have raised issues for the council to address. So in the past, the council has addressed things like um, sleep, uh, you know, sleep needs of kids. Um, they've done studies on concussions and uh, and testing for concussions. They've done studies on um, di the digital healthy use of digital devices in the classroom. So those are kind of historic types of things that the council has done. Um, I can't imagine if the council is reporting to the board that the board could certainly provide input in terms of priorities as well. Um, Julie, did you have a question? I did, thank you, Ms. Rowe. Um, Ms. Somerville, in terms of the role of the council, is what we're suggesting um, they do within the scope of their mission and what they expect their job to be? Um, I like the idea of identifying a specific group and, and tagging them with this, um, but I guess I'm, I want to make sure that we're assigning it to the right group um, and not another group like food and nutrition services or another team that's more closely tied to the food offerings. So I can answer partially and I would hope Jamie can jump in at the end. It, it could certainly be. So historically the council, the council meets as a whole group and then we break into sub work groups and we have these specific tasks. This could be a standing committee you know, that meets once or twice or thrice a year to, and reports out to the council. So that could be absolutely a tool. I don't know. I defer to Jamie whether there's a better vehicle for that. I don't know if there's a better vehicle right now. Um, obviously, I think that the onus of most of the implementation of, of including the students and such would be on my department. Um, you know, some of this we already kind of do or or we we just take one school and, and they're testing foods all day or whatever it might be. But um, I think it might be a good a good avenue to push it through the wellness committee. And I, I know um, Dr. Hager, you know, has a close ties to this and as, as do I. So um, I'm sure we would be on one of those subcommittees to make it happen. OK, so Great. is there a motion to amend the language to insert the language the school health council will convene um, before the words stakeholder work group so that it will read on at least an annual basis the um, health council the school health council will convene a stakeholder work group comprised of at least 40 percent students Well, we have to change a bit more than that, don't we? So I'm seeing a lot in a chat here. Sorry, I was just I was trying to help and I think I, I know everyone tried to help. And I can't find the original motion. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, um, I. Yeah. Go ahead. All right. OK, the original motion was on at least an annual basis. And so my I'm suggesting an amendment to insert on at least an annual basis. The school health council will convene. And then the rest would continue a stakeholder work group comprised of at least 40 percent students. And we strike and strike. Um, shall be convened. So that it reads 40% students to provide recommendations to the board and superintendent for but not limited to taste, quality, appeal, and inclusiveness of food options in BCPS. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah, I mean, there, lo local school health council is the right term though. Okay, local school health council. It, I believe that's what we've called it throughout, right? Okay, so, so the amendment would insert um, the local school health council after comma annual basis and strike shall be convened. It would insert the local school health health council shall or will convene. Yes, after the comma. But then later we have to strike shall be convened. 
Yes, so I wrote in the chat. So, I think I wrote that in the chat. OK, where did you write that? Oh, OK, and at least. OK, insert the local school health council shall convene. OK, does that make sense to everyone? Is there a motion to amend the language? So move Thomas. Okay. Second. Uh, second hen. Okay. Um, would someone mind typing the complete language into the chat for me? I got you. Person so that what you're voting, in. what you're voting on now, members of the committee, is the the motion to amend the okay. amendment. Okay. Um, Ms. Clark, would you call the vote to amend the um, amendment to the policy? Yes, Ms. Causey. Dr. Hager. Yes. Ms. Han. Yes. Ms. Mack. Mr. Thomas. Yes. Ms. Rowe. Yes. Four in favor. Okay, so that motion passes. So then the the language as amended. Are you still doing that, Christian? OK, on at least an annual basis, the local school health council shall convene a stakeholder work group comprised of at least 40 percent students to provide recommendations to the board and superintendent. For but not limited to taste, quality, appeal and inclusiveness of food options in BCPS. OK, would you call the roll for approving this amendment to the policy? Yes, Ms. Causey. Dr. Hager. Yes. Ms. Han. Yes. Ms. Mack. Mr. Thomas. Yes. Ms. Rowe. Yes. Four in favor. The motion passes. Are there any other um, amendments or questions about this policy? I just had one question. Um, I'm sorry, Christian, did you have a question? I have. Um, I was, Dr. Hager, I know had amendments and I have another amendment as well um, once you finish. Oh. Sorry. Um, I just had one question about this policy and that is there was um, some requirement at some point in time in some assignment where children were asked to keep a diary of things that they ate for a certain period of time and because of the religious fasting rules uh, my daughter completely refused to do this but had a difficult time explaining why because she's not really supposed to explain that she's fasting even though it's on the religious calendar and so what I wanted to know is are we going to um, either in the rule or somewhere make our staff knowledgeable that there are religious groups who have different fasting days on different days of the calendar and that we don't want children to have to have that be drawn attention to unnecessarily in how we're doing this nutrition education. So for instance, if a child is saying, well, I don't, you know, the food pyramid says eat meat, eat this, eat that, and the child says, well, I don't X number of days a year. Um, I guess I'm wondering where that line is gonna be drawn. So if it's okay, I would like to speak to nutrition education. Um, the practice that you have has actually been removed from all of our health education curriculum. So students are not asked to keep food diaries anymore. Um, now the practice is to look at healthy food options and to build a healthy plate off of some options. Um, so they are not asked in health education at least anymore to keep the food diary. Okay, so when they build a healthy plate, are there alternatives for what that healthy plate looks like for Vegan Absolutely. Yes, um, they even okay. explore um, different vegan lifestyles. They explore different non-dairy options. Um, they look at different ways, you know, protein. Calcium is not always from a milk product. Um, so really trying to increase students' knowledge of the different foods that are available to meet the different nutrient needs. Okay, that's great. So if a student did have a particular um, 
dietary prerequisite? Would, is there room in the curriculum for the student to voluntarily say, help me make a nutritious plate that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, free or is, you know, because like, for instance, just because I'm familiar with the Orthodox Christian fasting is from meat, wine, dairy and oil for as many as 40 days twice a year. So, for instance, like if the student voluntarily wanted help with that, it does the curriculum allow them to say, I I don't I want a healthy plate that doesn't include these things. Can you help me know what food items could be on that plate? Absolutely. Um, and really looking at nutritious options that grow from the earth um, is really our focus, looking at you know nutrient dense foods. We've really tried to take away the focus on calorie counting, not just from a religious standpoint, but also from students who may be experiencing eating disorders or disordered eating patterns. So it's more about how can I show up in my space, in my community, in my family, in my culture and choose healthy options that are within the beliefs of that, that system or that community. That's fantastic. I'm so happy to hear that and that you did away with the food diary. Yeah, it was it was problematic um, on you know the religious standpoint, but also we had people who were experiencing extreme anxiety and stress over they didn't want to eat at all because they want to disappoint their teacher or they were, you know, they felt like they had to lie about what they were eating or they didn't have access to the foods that were considered nutritious um, in their household or they're living in a food desert and they couldn't have access. So it was problematic on many things. So now it's trying to look at what are the the healthy food choices and then to make those choices work within the means of a family um, who might be on the run the entire time because they have sports and they're doing all these other things. So it's it's taken um, a big a big shift in you know what nutrition really we and we now call it healthy eating um, versus nutrition sure. education. And knowing what you should do and then being outed for not doing that feels a little bit invasive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it feels a little yeah. invasive. I want to eat a chocolate bar. Let me eat my chocolate bar, please. I know it's wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway, you know? <laughs> yeah, we create, we have created shame around food where food should be celebrated and um, meant to nourish the body. So, but thank you for your feedback um, and for, so for bringing that, up yeah, that. that. Those were my only questions or concerns. Okay, so um, Christian and Aaron, did you both have other motions to make on this policy? Okay. If, I do. Yeah. Okay, Aaron, could you type yours in the chat so I can read it appropriately? Also, state where in the policy it should go. So, like, we have line items in pages. That's very helpful. Oh, I'll add the line item exactly. Um, so, under uh, section two. I would add letter C, so right now it's A and B, so it would be at line 19. Um, so this would be under the responsibility for implementation. I think that's where the school health council language should go. That's not in there now. So um, the superintendent will appoint a local school health council consisting of school system leadership, local health department leadership, parents, community members, and students that will support the implementation of wellness initiatives in schools and I'm realizing now that should also include um, school staff probably in there as well. Any any other any feedback people have though? That's what the okay. motion. Is. <laughs> so. um, is there a second? Second Thomas. OK, are there any um, questions or comments to the motion? Section 2C, the superintendent will appoint a local school health council consisting of school system leadership, local health department leadership, parents, community members, and students that will support the implementation of wellness initiatives in schools. Christian, you had a question related to the motion. Yes, I just wanted to hear staff's uh, response to this addition to see if there's any pieces that are missing or anything else that maybe we should add. I just wanted to hear their response. Um, thank you. I think I agree with Dr. Hager's comment about um, adding, you know, BCPS staff. Well, it says school system leadership. Eh. I have no, no, no concerns about that. Parents. Yeah, I have no concerns. OK. okay. Um, you had a comment or a question? Just whether or not there should be any board leadership. Sorry, my dog's being loud. Um, 
whether or not through the appointment process or inclusion on the council. If Dr. Hager thought about that, I don't really have a strong preference either way. Just a question. I know of uh, at least two local school systems that have a board member who sits on their local school health council. I don't know if that's required in their policy or if they just do that because they care about the wellness, wellness uh, issues in the school system. Um, and I also know of several school systems where they have um, administrators who sit like school level administrators who sit on their local school health council. But again, I, I don't I don't know how broad to make to make this um, at this point or whether folks would like to see those types of additions to the policy itself. Thank you. I don't My know. other question was, did, yeah. did you envision that the superintendent would appoint all the members? Um, I I would love to, Ms. Somerville, how, how is the appointment process at this point? I know that, uh, is it just the, well, so it's the local school, school health council leadership that appoints the members, but the leadership is appointed by the superintendent. I don't know, you tell me. In the, in the past, it was it was a BCPS leadership decision, and and ultimately the superintendent made the final decision of who the members have been. Um, but we also we reach out to the health department and have them identify through Dr. Branch their recommended members, and then we identify you know through a variety of ways. And I think you participated in that in the first meeting this school year. We had we identified who was missing, and then we reached out and added some more folks. OK, are there any other comments or questions for the motion? Ms. Clark, would you call the roll? Ms. Rao, sorry, I was putting it in the chat. I'd like to. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, amend. Julie. Sorry. I'd like to amend the motion to uh, insert with board approval after the superintendent will appoint. Is there a second? I'll second it for the sake of discussion. Is the um, well, Ms. Hen, how do you envision that board approval would look like? Like, I'd hate to have this committee with this many members bogged down because the board starts getting into micromanaging the individual people on the health council. And there, how many health councils are there going to be? Just one, or one for each of the planning communities, or one for each school, or how how are we talking about one health council or one per region? So the local health council is at the local school system level, and then you can have wellness teams at each school. But so it's um, one council for the whole system. Right. But there are a lot of members. I know Ms. Somerville or, or Ms. Dr. McComas, I see is on there. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, you know, certainly, you know, this is your policy, but I would uh, keep in mind that, you know, we do provide like the annual report and we can always um, engage in um, a presentation at curriculum committee to get feedback and um, to provide updates. So I just offer that to say, given the scale of our school system, when I think about um, your point, Dr. Hager, that there are perhaps are some LEAs that have that, I, I wonder the scale of those school systems, right? We know like Somerset County, for example, uh, is a significantly different in scale than ours uh, as just one example. So I'm not sure where they stand um, on this, but I just offer that uh, because I do think you raise a good concern, Ms. Rowe, around um, things getting bogged down. Um, so offer that for consideration. I and think what I would take to my motion. What, yes, you can speak to that. Thank you. So yeah, the intent is not to bog anything down, um, but more as a point of information for the board to um, be aware of the appointees. It's helpful to see the expertise that's being brought to this. It shows that the board is committed to this initiative more than anything um, and could come to the board as a list of appointees similar to the other um, appointees that we receive. Um, at regular board meetings as they apply. So, Ms. Hen, as opposed to with board approval, would you be amenable to the language with board notification so that it comes as an information item? I would be. 
OK, Miss Holly, what's the easiest way to change that language? Because now we've got what an amendment. I'll withdraw amendment. and OK, make a new so amendment. you'll withdraw that and then OK. I move then, to insert after the superintendent will appoint. With board notification. And I'll second that. Are there any other comments on that amendment to the amendment? Ms. Clark, will you call the roll on amending the amendment to include with board notification? Yes, Ms. Causey. Dr. Hager. Yes. Ms. Han. Yes. Ms. Mack. Mr. Thomas. Yes. Ms. Rowe. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other comments or amendments to the original motion? Um, the superintendent will appoint a local school health council. Oh, I'm sorry. The motion as amended. The superintendent with board notification will appoint a local school health council consisting of school system leadership, local health department leadership, parents, community members, and students that will support the implementation of wellness initiatives in schools. Ms. Clark, will you call the roll on that motion, please? Ms. Causey. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Han? Yes. Ms. Math? Mr. Thomas? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Are there any other motions on the policy 5470? Mr. Thomas, could you please write that? Yes, thank you. Okay. I move to insert comma across all grade levels, period to line 10 of page four. And if I can read that out loud, it would then read um, each middle and high school provide opportunities for extracurricular physical activities, including the opportunity to participate in intramural sports, interscholastic inter and or corollary athletic programs across all grade levels. Are there intramural sports across all grade levels? What's the intent of your motion? Thank you. So uh, during one of my small town halls and my some of my school visits, I've learned from students. Do we sorry? need a second? Do we need a second before discussion? Uh, we do. I'm oh, sorry. Second. OK, Thank you. go ahead, Christian. Thank you. So during one of my small town halls and school visits across the county, I've learned that in some of our middle schools, uh, students are they're prohibiting sixth grade students from participating and only allowing seventh and eighth grade students to participate in uh, the sports. But other middle school sixth grade students are able to participate. So that's been a big concern that I've been hearing consistently for some of our young sixth grade athletes that really want to be involved in their school's culture and they're you know, having to go out to play on club teams and other teams. So I just wanted to specify that these opportunities to participate in the sports that we have for middle and high school students should be expanded across all grade levels. Like how if we have a sport in high school, and uh, you know, there's a varsity version that's only for seniors and juniors, then there's typically going to be a, a junior varsity version that is typically for, uh, you know, sophomores and, and freshmen. So I, I just wanted to make it clear that, you know, we're going to allow our sixth grade students in the select schools to come to mind to be able to participate in, in, in sports. So Christian, are you saying that we have some middle schools that allow sixth grade students and some that don't? Yes, from that's from what I've been hearing from students uh, in my small town halls and during school visits. Could staff I believe, speak to that, I believe yes, staff members are present, ma'am. Yeah, Ms. Prozer can uh, help us clarify. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McComas. Yes, so Christian, the difference between interscholastic and intramurals. Intramurals are physical education activities that happen after school. That is what's ever happening in physical education. Um, that is all grade levels. As far as interscholastic, which you were speaking about is athletics, and um, I cannot speak to that. Maybe Ms. Ferguson, Dr. Ferguson can. Um, that would be athletics um, with Mike Sai. Um, Mike Sai, he, that's a question we have to take back to him. He wasn't uh, invited to the call today. Yeah, so Mr. Thomas, I'll take that question back to Mr. Sai, and then we'll see about getting uh, a clarification to all of you on the middle school athletics program. OK, so. Um, co committee members, did you want to table this motion? 
So or are we just postponing it? It does. What is this policy if we postpone this? Ms. Howie, what does this do to the policy if we postpone this? Can this policy wait to have information brought back from staff? So uh, we had, we've already provided to uh, the state, we did that as of July 2021, our, um, actually, actually to the feds, our triennial, uh, our hope was to get this passed um, by this June, uh, but it's not required. It was last June when we had to get our triennial assessment. Um, however, as you know, members of the committee, we don't necessarily move at a particularly um, quick pace. So to bring this back would simply delay it all the more. We do have another meeting scheduled in May, but that's already a packed agenda. So we are looking forward to the committee passing this. I see. So, so we have to decide today whether to add the language across all grade levels to the end of that sentence. You can send it forward and prior to and before it is voted on in first reader staff can have the information available and if the uh, if the full board still wishes to amend the policy can be amended on first or second reader uh, mr thomas does that satisfy you it does yes uh that sounds okay. good so I withdraw my my motion if someone's supposed to draw their second. I withdraw my second. Mr. Thomas, I'm going to put this um, on you and ask you to follow this. I will. And to make the motion in open session when the time comes. OK. I also have another motion, but it looks like go so does Dr. Hager. OK, I can go first. Um, I move to insert each middle and high school will provide opportunities for extracurricular activities related to school climate, culture, and student identity to continue cultivating a positive social emotional climate to line 31 on page five. Is there a second? Can Mr. Thomas repeat his motion, please? Sure. I move to insert each middle and high school will provide the opportunities for extracurricular activities related to school climate, culture, and student identity to continue cultivating a positive social emotional climate to line 31 of page five under social emotional support services. I'm I will second it. I'm I I'd like to hear more about what you have to say. Sure. Okay. Can I speak Ms. to my Yes, I was just gonna ask you to do that. Thank you. So as we earlier in the uh, under the when we were, we were just discussing under the physical environment oh sorry what we were just discussing you know we talked about extracurricular activities for our students when it comes to the ability um to maintain a healthy uh, body and to continue to be active however we're not discussing the ways in which students are going to try to continue to make their their environment in school a social a positive social emotional learning climate. And I think that through talking with students in school visits and in my small town halls, a lot of those abilities for students to cultivate um, some of the, the stronger climates are to have conversations in school buildings. And a lot of those school conversations are happening in identity groups in schools, in groups like the Black Student Union or the Asian Student Association or the GSA. They're happening in groups that are focused on school climate, like our equity group uh, club in some of our schools. And I just think with this motion, what I'm what I'm asking for is that we're we're making sure that we have an opportunity for those students uh, to pursue those conversations and extracurricular activities in all of our schools. Um, and I think that you know some of our schools do a much greater job than other schools. Um, and so I I think this is just solidifying and codifying in our policy that it's the expectation that we have extracurriculars for those purposes to create a positive social emotional uh, climates in our schools. Okay, I'd like to ask Zach a question about this amendment. Um, so right now I know that a lot of these extracurricular activities are things that happen because a staff member has volunteered 
to run a club, if we were to put this in policy, how would this be facilitated and can we facilitate it? Because now we're making it a mandate. If staff could answer that. <laughs> right, I would. We'll go ahead, Ms. Ferguson. So um, one of the, the EDAs that we proposed this school year was a social emotional learning um, representative in the school. Um, that would be similar to some of the EDAs that run the after school clubs. Um, this particular uh, person would be um, the person that would um, move forward a lot of our um, campaigns related to social emotional wellness for students, our Mind Over Matters campaign, um, and would champion all of those um, activities. So right now that particular position is a, a, is a grant funded um, EDA, meaning a stipend, um, but we're proposing, we will be proposing that it becomes a regular EDA um, as um, identified by TABCO. So that position actually, we, we, we actually wrote it into our behavioral health grant for um, this school year. And we are working with um, administrators and identifying the person who would move, um, move those particular activities forward. So um, it's a social emotional learning, social emotional support liaison, um, not a position, but a person that's identified in the school that would um, that would champion the work that comes through um, my department. OK, so if we approve this, then we do have this staff capacity to fulfill it. It, it would be a stipend. It's not an additional person. It would be a person um, just like doing after school, um, beyond the school day activities to support. So, Ms. Sure. Roy, let me clarify. It doesn't mean that we have identified people to do it. We just have identified funds that we could pay a staff member who would be willing to volunteer. I would also just like to point out we do have a policy 5320 one student organizations and clubs. And so I think to some degree, as we were talking earlier around the, um, the food uh, policies, like there, we're touching on a lot of different things here. Um, and I don't know that this policy needs to be the sort of uh, catch all, uh, you know, because they, these things connect to other policies, so. So it's, so if we put this in there, it's entirely possible that the existing clubs at some schools would already meet this, but then other schools would use the EDA money to create other extracurricular opportunities. So the so EDA funds that we have is, is specifically for social emotional support, not for um, not necessarily um, clubs that are not related to that topic. I see. OK, Julie, you had a comment. I did. Thank you. Um, I agree that I think we are trying to put everything into this policy um, with the kitchen sink and that there are policies, the um, activities and clubs where this more closely aligns. And my concern is that we may be contradicting something that is in that policy or certainly that belongs in that policy. Um, my other comment is that it's my understanding that these clubs are student initiated, or at least the ones that are most active and most engaged are student initiated. And I wouldn't want to dictate to schools um, or mandate rather which clubs they they need to have because it is student generated or student led. So that would be my concern. Um, not that we don't want to support students in whatever they want to create. Um, based on demand for those, but it's not a one size fits all. And I feel like putting it into policy says you have to have these specific organizations. So I don't believe this fits here. Um, I think we do need to look at it when we um, visit our, our policy on um, student clubs and also take some more time with the language to ensure that we are recognizing that students have unique needs and ensure that we respect their rights to create the clubs that they so desire. So for that reason, I I probably won't be supporting this, not that I don't support the concept. I just think it's the, the wrong policy to do so and that it needs some thought. Thank you. So Mr. Thomas, um, so was it your intention that an opportunity for extracurricular activity would be 
a club dedicated to this social emotional learning or are we talking about something that might be less than a club like an after school seminar on one topic and then maybe because I could see I mean I equated it to clubs but I'm not sure that Mr. Thomas meant to equate it to clubs I was just suggesting that if a school had a club that dealt with student identity for instance that club might fulfill this language and then but if it but I don't know like I do think it's appropriate to have language in here that talks about extracurricular social emotional learning opportunities and that's different than clubs I think but some clubs could also cover the need. Mr. Thomas. So Thanks. excuse me members of the committee I'll obviously uh, let the committee proceed but just want to point out that we are at 10 minutes till six and have not yet uh, completed review of one policy. You do have several other policies uh, and numerous staff members uh, on the call waiting to present and I'm sure anxious to present because their policies are significant as well. Thank you, Ms. Howie, for the timestamp. Um, so, Christian, if you could speak quickly to this so that we can process this. Yes, I think because we are outlining some of the extracurricular uh, activities in this policy, you know, we're already outlining some of those some of those topics. You know, we're identifying recess and other things in physical education, but then we're also talking about physical activity and and sports and other extracurriculars related to physical activity. So I think it's it's more than appropriate here. I mean, I was reading the uh, extracurricular policy, and I think that this is the right place for something that's talking about social emotional learning, uh, extracurricular activities. And I think that with the language, and my intent was yes, if a if a student club a school already has a club that is related to social emotional learning and student identity then that would be satisfied um but if it was to be like Ms. Royce said a seminar or some type of activity this is just saying that there the school will provide opportunities for extracurricular activities related to school climate culture and student identity so it it's up to kind of the interpretation of of, of the school in my opinion and it could be a club and i would love to see more clubs related to that that are student initiated but it could be you know just uh, some of those conversations after school and it could be a you know student council that is having conversations about school climate and culture and student identity that's already established okay um miss clark could you please call the role on inserting each middle and high school will provide opportunities for extracurricular activities related to school climate culture and student identity to continue cultivating a positive social emotional climate to line 31 of page five. Ms. Rowe, may I? I'm sorry, go ahead, Ms. Han. I just wanted to make a quick comment to Mr. Thomas's last point. Um, I love that each school would have that flexibility. I, I think that the the language needs work and, and that's the only reason I, I would not support it, only because I, I agree with it, but I, I think that the policy needs to give more guidance as to what the board's vision is. And you just communicated it beautifully, Christian, but that's not in the language. So I just think we we should table it and put some more work into the language so that schools know exactly what your vision is for it. Because you just articulated it. It's just not in the language yet. And I think it should be. Thank okay. you. Ms. Hen. Ms. Clark, could you take the role? Ms. Causey? Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Hen? No. Ms. Mack? Mr. Thomas? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. We have three votes. Is that a tie? So like, do we include the absent members? You do. So you do not have a majority of the members of the committee. OK, so we need four to carry. So the motion does not carry. OK, Ms. Hager. Um, yes, yeah, so I have uh, just a few 
changes that are related to my earlier comments. Um, and I put two separate motions in the chat, but I did that so you could see kind of why why they align. Um, the first would be on page two, line 16, to strike the word liaison and add in its place um, so that the full line would read appointing a wellness champion who oversees a school level wellness team in their school and annually so and so. And then the, the second, well, that's the first motion. Should I, should I? Just, just read the entire list. And if no one on the committee objects to any of these changes, we okay. will do a consensus vote. OK, that sounds good. And then the second motion would be on page six, lines 19 to 20. Strike the word a wellness champion, and instead it would say designating an employee wellness liaison in each school and office. And so those two changes kind of go together because wellness champion is more as more of a standard uh, term that's used throughout the state for the person who oversees the wellness team. Um, and it sounds like this role of wellness champion that we've used is really more of an employee wellness liaison. So that was just kind of alternating that wording so that it's more consistent with the rest of the state. Um, and then uh, replacing USDA Smart Snacks Nutrition Standards with Maryland Nutrition Standards for all foods sold in schools. And there's one place in the policy where it says Baltimore County School Health Council and everywhere else it says local school health councils. So replacing those as well. So those are my wording changes. Does anyone on the committee object to these changes? Or any of the changes? And then I have, no one, I have one actual motion that's like an addition, but it's also related yeah, to what I said earlier. Let me, say, let, let me finish. Okay, yeah. Hearing none, the, the policy will be amended according to these changes, which are written in chat. Go ahead, Aaron. you have okay. one more motion? Yeah, and this is it, I swear. Um, so then this would be what I mentioned earlier about the last piece of the federal policy about all foods provided but not sold during the school day. And so I would add, I would move to add um, under section 3A5G, all other foods and beverages available on the school campus but not sold, such as those provided at classroom parties and school celebrations must meet the Maryland Nutrition Standards for all foods sold in schools. And that's what's in our regulation right now. OK, does anyone on the committee object to these language changes? Hearing none, the policy will be amended according to um, Ms. Hager and what she's written in the chat. So these all seem like just basically aligning our language with the regulations. OK, um, Ms. Hager, would you, um, Dr. Hager, sorry, would you write um, these specific language changes that we just approved into a Word document and give it to staff so that they have. Do you need that, Ms. Howie? You're we fine. Okay. Based what's in the in the chat. Thank you for the oh. offer, however. Okay. Um, so let's see. Moving along here. Are there any other changes or amendments to policy 5470? OK. Does anyone object to moving policy 5470 forward to the full board for first reader? Hearing no objections, the policy is moved forward. The next policy, um, Ms. Howie, do you have another policy on the agenda you'd like to take next, given that we're over our time? Or that we're. Uh, I would ask. Sorry, I would ask that we at least uh, complete our unfinished business with policy 1270 and that the remaining staff members who are present um, be excused and we will have to reschedule uh, the, the policies that were on the agenda. OK, um, so the, the staff members can be excused. excused. We will continue with policy 1270, parent and family engagement. Presenting is Ms. Charlie Green, Dr. McComas, Dr. Withstead, Ms. Stanbury, and Ms. Hahn. Ms. Charlie Green, please proceed. I'm actually stepping in for Ms. Charlie Green this evening, um, uh, and uh, we're partners in our work. And um, I'll be introducing Ms. Hahn. We actually will take it away. Uh, she is the fundamental um, champion of this particular policy. So thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, just as a refresher, 
Um, I want to remind you that policy 1270 validates the Board of Education's belief and commitment to meaningful partnerships among schools, families, and caregivers and community members to enhance student achievement through engagement. Focus area four of the BCPS Compass, Community Engagement and Partnerships, addresses the need for BCPS to establish and maintain a high level of inclusive family and community engagement and increased partner effectiveness. This policy substantiates the shared vision of the Board of Education that families, caregivers, and communities play a key role in supporting academic achievement and ensuring that students are prepared for career or college opportunities. Approval of Policy 1270 will move the system forward, forward by creating conditions supportive of family engagement programs that have been developed in collaboration with families and community partners. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Han, I see you have a, a motion to amend. Could you read that? I do. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. I move to amend policy one, sorry, 1270 by inserting on page one, line 39. The superintendent will provide parents slash guardians online access to student curriculum and instructional materials, except where prohibited by law. In those instances, materials will be made available for in-person review. Is there a second? I will second that. Um, is there any comment, debate, questions? I, may I uh, speak to my motion? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Ms. Hen. Thank you. Um, so this directly supports the intent of engaging families to support student success um, by providing them easier access to their students' work. Um, the most frequent complaint that I receive from families is the inability to access their students' materials, to be able to help them with homework, um, to be able to see their um, lessons, their materials, their tests, even through um, the online system as it is now, whether through their students' accounts or through parent accounts, they their frequent complaint is they can't see anything. They can't access the materials um, that they simply aren't available um, through access to books, through access to online materials, whatever the case may be. And they want to help. We These are engaged families. And we have a hard enough time engaging families who aren't engaged. We we can't stand to lose any of our families, um, certainly the ones that are, are trying. So by making these materials more readily accessible, easily accessible, um, we can support student achievement by engaging them at home with their um, parents and caregivers. And that's the intent of my motion. Um, where we cannot easily do this through licensing of copyrighted materials, we can make those materials available in schools for in-person review without creating undue burden or um, legal hassle on the system. So I ask for your support for this. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Mr. Thomas, you had a question? Thank you. Now I'm realizing it's more of a comment. Um, I think, just, I feel like Parents already do have access to all of the materials that they might that may, they might need. For example, I can put in my BCPS username and password into Schoology and give my mom my laptop and she can go through all of my classes and see all of the materials and see everything I'm learning and see all my grades and all my tests and literally everything already. So if that I don't see what this would do in terms of that, if, if the intent is to have all this information available to anyone so like for example to put all of the all of lesson plans all of lessons all powerpoints everything on maybe the bcps website so that anyone can access it and look at it then i feel like that's a little burdensome to our teachers because they're already adding it all into schoology and not sometimes it's not even always schoology to other things as well um i also feel like it could open the door for maybe like more cheating in classes um, and academic dishonesty because if we're posting the information online, um, then during the middle of an, a, a, student, teachers can actually like, you know, un, un bookmark things. They can take things off of Schoology when there's a test going on and many teachers do, um, but students could just Google search it, find it on the website and it could enhance academic dishonesty. I don't know. I just feel like right now, 
I, my mom does it all the time with the little siblings. They will she'll sit down with them on they'll go into Schoology and they'll go through everything and they'll use the review materials there. And what if, for example, a teacher forgot to put something on the on the website and they'd be out of compliance? It's like I just feel like, you know, it's we can already just look on Schoology and see everything that we're learning. Um, so I don't know if I'll support this. Um, and to make it widely publicly accessible is just going to be extremely burdensome to our teachers, in my opinion. Sure, I would just like to add a staff um, to Mr. Thomas's point. Um, parents do have access to all the things that he described through Schoology. Um, if we have parents who need support in learning how to access Schoology, we're happy to provide that. Uh, it also has a an app, a mobile app that's available on, on a telephone as well. Um, in addition, we do post our curriculum on the website. Now, many people do not understand what curriculum is and what it isn't. In our policy 6000 and uh, 6000, we have definitions around what curriculum is and what it isn't. So um, I too would say that we, um, we have multiple access points. And of course, there's no better access point than to have a conversation with a, a child's teacher around um, what exactly is being covered in a particular unit, uh, what are the resources used to teach that um, unit, and keeping in mind that our teachers do have um, the professional authority to have uh, individual lesson plans that address the specific needs of the students in front of them, um, and that is all part of the, the layers that go into teaching and learning. So it's oftentimes people misunderstand uh, what curriculum is and what it isn't. So Thank you. I think one thing that I would like to see is I understand what you're saying about having my child bring me their computer and log into their account, but I have a parent account and I can see my students grades from my parent account, but it would be nice if I could see all of the instructional materials as well, because every once in a while you get an uncooperative child who doesn't necessarily want to make it easy for you to hold them accountable about X number of homework assignments that weren't done or whether they're graded or and as a parent, the difficulty I have is. Um, children don't want you to use their login access because they've been told by school staff not to share that information with anyone and they're more than happy to stand on that if it's the not turned in assignment you're asking about. So if my parent login ID could see all of the same things that my student could see, that is where I thought this was going. And I would actually really like to see that because it would make it easier for me to parent. Um, Ms. Hen. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. And there are materials and, and just the methods of teaching. Of course, teachers have the freedom to to incorporate those into their lesson plans, but parents do not have insight into that. And when you're trying to teach your student, you know, the way you were taught and they say, that's not how Ms. So-and-so taught, taught me, well, show me, show me what you're being taught. There's nothing. And when there's no book, there's nothing on Schoology. Well, she's referred to such and such in class. Well, can you show me? No, because I couldn't follow it in class. Well. It's right. <laughs> there's nothing for parent then then both of you are lost and and that's the type when there are resources being used in the classroom that aren't online that aren't on Schoology that aren't in the students account the students left without the home without the help they need to complete the homework the parents left without any resources and not having been sitting next to the student in class has no way of knowing what is how it's being taught to to help, um, that's the the issue. It, it's not what is on Schoology, um, it's what is not, and what is being used in class for instruction. And that very much is part of the curriculum. It's not included on the website because each teacher has the liberty and freedom to teach the way they see fit and according to the needs of their class. But if parents and guardians are to be the partners in that and to reinforce that learning at home, which I believe is the intent of this policy, then they need a little help. And that's the intent of this motion is to give students that extra support by equipping their parents or guardians with the tools they need to be able to say to Mary, yeah, Mary, I know you're struggling. Here's let's look at this together. Here's what you were shown in class. 
let me see how it was taught to you. Let me try to teach myself and then I can help you because we know that th there aren't enough hours in the day for our teachers to do it all and they need those supports at home. That's that's the Perfect. intent of this. Thank you. So that question, Ms. Hen, are you asking or is it your expectation that student cre that teacher created lesson plans have to be provided in addition to uh, the curricular framework? The, the intent is that students get the help they need and there are key resources that that is the intent of this motion that key resources be accessible to parents equitably. So I understand that, ma'am. I'm just trying to understand again uh, based on your comments and also obviously staff would want to comply with any policy that uh, the board passes and if your intent is that all teacher created lesson plans also be provided because of um, the, this amendment to the language I'm just trying to understand if that was your intent as well or your expectation. The intent is that materials that are used in curriculum that students are need for instruction be accessible to parents online. That's the intent, except we're prohibited by law because we do use copyrighted materials that we can't republish. That's a given. So if parents need to see, hey, what what were we using to teach such and such of a text? If that's copyrighted, they could come into the classroom and review that. That's allowed, but we can't republish that on our website. OK, would be the the exception. That's my intent, that students would have the supports they need at home by having the same materials they can access in the classroom at home and that their parents would have equal access to those as well. Understood. So is it yeah. your desire, maybe that's the better word, that that include teacher created materials, so teacher lesson plans? The lesson plans, no, the materials, yes. So I would just say, Ms. Hen, that gets very close into the teacher lesson plans that many of the teacher developed materials are. Uh, that's part of a, a workload um, piece and that can stand separate from curriculum framework. So uh, my biggest concern, because I agree with you, we want every parent to feel very connected and engaged in their students learning and we want our parents to feel supported in that process as well. Um, my biggest concern is that uh, if we have a parent who is not able to see the resources they need through Schoology or the broad um, the curriculum as posted online, um, my first the first thing we need to do is make sure that the teacher and the parent have a communication with each other around it, uh, you know Mary's uh, struggle in bridges if as an example. Um, so uh, please know that we too want to make sure that our parents are supported and have the resources and are well connected to support our children in their learning process. Uh, but we want to be cautious not to uh, inadvertently um, wander into um, really overburdening our teachers with um, what needs to be posted online. And thank you for that. And I would um, add the word key Instruct before instructional materials, if that would um, clarify the intent of the motion to restrict it to um, key materials used for instruction to provide clarity and direction. That the intent is not everything, but and, and allow teachers at their discretion to determine what are key materials so that parents have access to critical resources needed for at-home support. And Ms. Hen, is it your intention that this would be provided through the parent Schoology portal or that this would be, because I guess my thing is, is the teachers are already entering all this stuff into the student portal. So why is it such a big deal for technology or Mr. Corns to release the permissions to allow parents to see that stuff in their portal too? It doesn't seem like you would have to duplicate the entries so much as just release the permissions so that parents can see what the students can see. Like Correct. that, because I don't like the idea that right now as a parent, 
For my first child, I used a whole lot of sticky notes and would simply stick things to paper and send emails. Please reteach such and such a thing that involved no vocabulary that anyone understood. Um, my kid didn't understand it. Please reteach it, right? Because the child comes home in second grade and cannot even explain to you. All they know is the subject. Sometimes they don't even remember the teacher's name that taught them the thing they don't know how to explain that they're now crying at dinner that they don't understand because you said something was wrong and you don't know, right? So I used a lot of sticky notes doing that for the first child. Now I'm on the third child and my method for the third child is go talk to your sister. <laughs> this is a terrible place as a parent to be in because when I was a kid, I would bring the book home and my grandfather would say, show me the book. Where's your homework in the book? And three pages before the homework was the chapters saying what it is that you're supposed to be doing. It was the actual lesson that the teacher taught. So the problem is now that so many things are virtual and I go into my parent portal for Schoology, there's literally nothing there. Or I'll get an email that says your, the, this assignment wasn't turned in yet. And I'll, I can even get them to show it to me in their portal. And the actual assignment isn't even there. Like, there's just nothing. Yes, and if I may respond, Ms. Rowe, that's, that's precisely the problem and that this tr attempts to address. And teachers know what is critical and what they're using. Um, and, I, and granting that access, <laughs> granting that access in Schoology, would probably address 85% to 90%, I'm guessing, of the, the issue because they're already published to students. Well, I, I will, I do hear what you're um, asking in terms of ensuring that our parents have um, access to the same view uh, as the student view. That is certainly something I can take back to work with um, our vendor Schoology is our current LMS. Um, it is more advanced and user friendly compared to our prior LMS um, that we shifted from a few years back. Um, I do know we've been working extensively with Ms. Hahn's group um, to create uh, parent resources around curriculum initiatives. And I don't know if Ms. Hahn, if there's anything you'd like to share on that. Well, um, thank you. We continue to rebuild on Parent University um, and share information through our, um, we have liaisons in every school um, and there are messengers and they share the information with families. And then we also work with our PTAs and we, um, as I have to present tonight at 630 to the PTA leaders and I share a lot of the information. But um, I'm still grieving over the loss of the Parent University website where so much of this was there. And so we're working with um, CNI to, to rebuild and get those resources back up. We do have a lot of videos um, presently that um, uh, families can access on Parent University and um, we, ha we are building the resources there. Okay, are there any other comments or questions on this motion? I will just say that I have um, reached out to get more confirmation about what is viewable by um, parent login. Um, and my understanding is they are able to see uh, resources. They can also see assignments, um, uh, but they're not able to, to your point, Ms. Hen, uh, see resources that are rostered or that we uh, pay for through um, a subscription to a publisher uh, because they're not rostered. Uh, the most complete access would uh, be, of course, to use, you know, you could log in through your students and you'll see even those rostered uh, resources. So thank you for letting me add that. Okay, any more questions or comments? Ms. Clark, will you take the roll, please? Ms. Causey, Dr. Hager. Sorry, this, this is for the amendment, right? This is for the amendment. Um, to the policy to this is Ms. Hen's motion. I move to amend policy 1270 by inserting on page one, line 39, the superintendent will provide parents, guardians, online access to student curriculum and instructional materials except where prohibited by law. 
In those instances, materials will be made available for in-person review. No. Ms. Han? Yes. Ms. Mack? Mr. Thomas? No. Ms. Rowe? No. Motion the motion fails. The motion fails. Are there any other questions, comments, or motions related to policy 1270? Okay, is there any objection from the committee for moving policy 1270 forward to first reader? Hearing none, policy 1270 is moved forward for first reader. Thank you. We have. Is there anything that we need to cover that we can cover, Ms. Howie, in only a couple of minutes remaining? So uh, I would ask if Dr. McComas and Ms. Hahn can be excused, please. Yes, ma'am, they may be excused. Thank you. And members of the committee, I will report back to you after Dr. McComas has done her research about the expanded access to the learning management system. Obviously, that is something of interest to uh, Ms. Hen and other members of the committee. So as soon as I get that information, I'll report that back. Uh, members of the committee, my recommendation would be uh, that we proceed to item D, board policies 3215, 3230, and 3231, because those all address the Office of the Inspector General uh, report and compliance. Uh, you've already passed, uh, you did at your last meeting, three other procurement policies. Uh, we've done the same thing, made one do for all, as my grandmother used to say. The language that's been added to each of these policies, uh, I will refer you to 3215, line uh, 12, page one. The board will comply with all contract solicitation and procurement procedures as outlined in section 5.112 the education article. So that's the language that was that was that is being recommended that was approved by you at your last board meeting for three other policies on second reader. There are no curves to this one um, unless the board or the committee wants additional curves. OK, are there any um, questions, comments or additional amendments to policies 3215, 3230 and 3231? OK, hearing none, does any board member object to moving 3215, 3230 and 3231 forward to the full board for first reader? Okay, hearing none, those have, powerless pieces. Yes. Sorry, is there, am I missing the, someone? Yes, this is Julie. Sorry. Yes. Go ahead. I move to postpone those to the next meeting. Um, is there a second? We did not have a chance to discuss those. Okay. Um, they were on the agenda for today. Right. Yes, so that's correct. Did you so think it is more time to discuss than the next 10 minutes? I have more to discuss than in the next 10 minutes on those. OK, I'll second the motion to uh, postpone them. Is there any discussion on postponing those motions? Christian? These are the motions that are just adding in the language that we've been adding to other policies, right? Correct. OK, so then I, I don't agree with postponing them because you, you we're going to those are still going to be in the policy review cycle, so we can actually discuss them and really look into them. We're just making sure that we follow the Office of the Attorney General's recommendations, our own set of recommendations in PRC to so just add this language in. Um, so I, I think it's I think we can just add a language and move on. Um, so I, I don't agree with postponing it. We already have so many other policies we have to review. OK, thank you, Ms. Clark. Will you call the roll on the motion to postpone? Ms. Rowe, I withdraw my motion. OK, thank you, Ms. Hen. Um, OK, so I'll, I'll just, I've lost my place. So 
Are there any comments, motions to amend regarding policies 3215, 3230, or 3231? Hearing none, does anyone in the committee object to moving these policies forward to first reader? Okay, hearing none, the policies are moved to the full board for first reader. Policies 3215, 3230, and 3231. Thank you, members of the committee. Uh, members of the committee, there's also a proposed meeting date for August. Uh, staff is proposing August 16th. Uh, that is just uh, after uh, staff will be coming back to, uh, uh, to open schools. Uh, so the administrative and supervisory meeting is that upcoming Friday, so we do anticipate the staff will be back from um, vacation by that time. So that is our proposed date. Yes, Mr. Ms. <laughs> Sorry. Do any committee members object to that date? No objections from me. OK. That is an acceptable date by my calendar. Thank Julie, you. Julie, you know? OK. We will and add that to the calendar and put in um, an invitation so that it can be on your um, your calendars. And, and so yes, did, I did I understand that that was the meeting that that we had intended that staff would not be necessary for that we would do the 8000 series policies that are up for review. Correct. OK, thank you. You're welcome. So I have one other item, members of the committee, um, just a brief update. Um, I know you have as well Committee General Good and Welfare. If there are other issues the committee wishes to discuss, but just very briefly to make sure that the committee is updated, the status of policy 8. 315 and that is the policy on participation by the public. Uh, as you recall, uh, there was a parent group that sought uh, to be designated as a stakeholder group. Uh, I believe Baltimore County Parent and Student Coalition uh, and the the board uh, directed the policy review committee to review policy 8315 to revise it, to amend it. Uh, after the board uh, made that motion and gave that direction, there was a challenge to the policy that was taken to the State Board of Education that, that was then followed by um, a motion for reconsideration that was lost uh, as well after the State Board upheld the board's actions, uh, basically by denying that it had jurisdiction then the case was further appealed to the Circuit Court of Baltimore County. Uh, on last Wednesday, May 4th, a hearing was held before Judge Ballou Watts in Circuit Court. Uh, there is expected to be a written decision within the next 30 days. That's usually how long it takes. So hopefully by that time we'll know whether or not there are any uh, changes that the court believes are necessary to the policy. But that is a policy that is sort of being held in abeyance until there is uh, some sort of uh, judicial decision or determination about whether or not there need to be any changes to the policy. Certainly, if the committee wishes that that policy be placed on an agenda prior to uh, getting a decision from the circuit court or knowing whether or not it will be further appealed, um, that is up to the committee. But wanted to make sure the committee was aware that that litigation is still going on. Ms. Howie, do you have an expectation as to whether or not that litigation will be concluded before our August meeting so we could include that 8000 policy with the others? So if Judge Ballou Watts issues in June uh, and if there is no appeal, then yes, we could include it in August. If there's an appeal that ensues after the opinion is issued and rendered, uh, then you can at least get an update. I'll provide you with an update in August as to uh, where the case is. Okay. Does the does the committee 
object to tentatively putting that policy on the August agenda unless it remains in litigation. OK, hearing no objections, let's plan to do that then, Ms. Howie. OK. We'll do that. OK, is there anything else that we absolutely have to finish today? No, ma'am. Besides everything that will be here for the next three hours, people, I know you guys want to go home. Um, OK, so are there any objections to moving the unfinished agenda items onto the next agenda? OK, hearing none, the unfinished agenda items will be moved to the next PRC meeting and the meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice evening. It's very lovely out. Thank you, members of the committee. Enjoy your evenings.